First of all, I want to thank you so much for having me in today. I'm really excited. I am a huge dyed in the wool, honest to God, Google fanatic. I'm a Gmail guy. I'm an Android guy. I live and die by all of your products. So I really, really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to you today. Thank you so much. My name's Anthony Caparelli, and I'm going to be talking about whiskey, if that's OK. Yeah? Great. So we got a couple of. Uh, a couple of things that I want to talk to you about um, in the whiskey category, um, but I'm really going to end up focusing on scotch because that's kind of my love. And to me, it's, it's one of the more interesting of the whiskey categories. But I'm going to cover as much of whiskey as I can. Just a little bit about myself so you kind of know um, who this person is who's going to be yapping at you for the next 60 minutes. Come on in, come on in, come on in. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, I have started as a bartender about 20 years ago and then moved into training bought a restaurant, sold a restaurant. I've been teaching for a long time. I've worked for some really, really cool people in the industry, including Bobby Flay. I'm currently the brand ambassador for Drambuie Scotch Liqueur, which we will be tasting at the TGIAF, right? At five o'clock, so we're gonna go right from here upstairs, and I have all my boys upstairs. I'm going to be tasting some really, really cool Drambuie cocktails. But before we do that, I wanna teach you about whiskey and scotch. So, first thing, what is whiskey? Whiskey is a huge category right now. Whiskey is experience a, experiencing a boom, the likes of which, if most companies were experiencing this boom, we would want to be invested. Just the bourbon category, to give you an idea, bourbon is up 17% year over. Just, just bourbon alone. They can't make enough bourbon. You guys have recently probably followed the Maker's Mark fiasco where they had to water down Maker's Mark in order to meet demand and then they said, no, 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 we're not actually gonna do that because people hated them, right? So whiskey is a huge, huge category, but what is it? What is whiskey? We're not as familiar with whiskey as we once were in this country. Before Prohibition, most of the spirits we drank in this country were whiskey. They were dark spirits. At its most basic, basic level, Whiskey is a distilled alcoholic beverage made from fermented grains, that's really important, and aged in wooden casks. So that really, that last part, aged in wooden casks, that's the money. That's what makes whiskey, whiskey. So you start with a grain product, you ferment it, you distill it, and then you age it in wood. Anything that you do that follows those basic guidelines falls into the whiskey category. It comes from the old English word, usquiba. Everyone say usquiba with me. Usquiba. It's fun. It's a fun word to say. So usquiba means water of life. And the reason that I bring that up is because it shows the importance that whiskey has had over time. People literally put whiskey on the same level in terms of importance as water, and even more so, because back in the day, 1200, 1300, back before there were clean municipal water supplies, when we were in the old world in Europe, if you drank the water from the river, you were gonna get sick and you were probably gonna die. Because this is how it worked, folks. You would go to the river and you would take your water. You'd bring it back to your house, you'd clean with it, you'd bathe with it, you'd cook with it. You'd do bodily functions with the water, then you'd dump it out into the curb, into the gutter, and it would run back into the river. Great system unless you live downstream from that city, because then the water you were pulling out of the river was all of their wastewater, right? So what happened was fermented beverages and distilled beverages, beverages with alcohol in them, turned out to be much healthier and much safer to drink than water. People who drank water got sick. People who drank beer, wine, cider, whiskey did not, all right? So water of life, usquiba. Really, really important to kind of put this in context. Types of whiskey, we have Scotch whiskey. Obviously, we have Irish whiskey. Bourbon is a type of whiskey. Rye, Canadian, Japanese. Many, many countries today are making their own forms of whiskey. But I want you to know that Scotch isn't its own thing. Scotch is Scotch whiskey. Bourbon isn't its own thing. Bourbon is bourbon whiskey. So all of these things are grain spirits that have been fermented, distilled, and aged in wood. All right, we see some spelling variations. You probably noticed this. Traditionally, without the E is used for Scotch and Canadian. With the E is used for pretty much everything else. Whiskey was probably invented in Ireland. However, 
The Scotch were the first people to write down a definition for whiskey, so they kind of get credit for it. All right, so we think probably the Irish invented it, but they were too busy drinking it in order to write down what it was. So we gave it to the Scotch. Couple of things about the category of whiskey. UK, cereal grain mash. I'm gonna get a little geeky with you guys because I understand there are a lot of engineers in the room. I actually have a mechanical engineering degree, so later on we're gonna get a little geekier than I sometimes get. But distillation to less than 95% ABV. I'm gonna talk about the significance of that in a minute when I do my distillation demo. Aging in oak casks, and it has to be bottled at not less than 80 proof. All right, 80 proof is what percent alcohol? 40. 40, right. You take the proof, you cut it in half, and you end up with the percent alcohol. I'll talk about that in just a second. So before we get into whiskey and what it is, I want to talk to you a little bit about alcohol itself. Because alcohol is the active ingredient. Alcohol is what makes whiskey whiskey. And the alcohol we're talking about is ethyl alcohol or ethanol. It's volatile. Right? That means it evaporates easily, it's flammable, it burns, colorless, and it is a liquid. It's a central nervous system depressant with significant psychoactive effects. That means it makes us want to dance and sing karaoke and hang out with people in parties. That's why we like it. It's also toxic in relatively small quantities. That's just about one half of one percent. All right? So this is why we kind of got to be careful. It is made through the fermentation of sugar. That's the only way that we make ethyl alcohol, folks. It's not made in the lab somewhere. Dow Chemical doesn't produce it. It's made through the fermentation of sugar. Who here is a home brewer? Do I have any home brewers? Yes. Awesome. You make beer, wine, cider, beer? Pretty easy to make beer, right? Yeah, just keep it sanitized. That's, it's difficult to make beer taste good. It's easy to actually make beer. I'm going to show you how easy it is to make beer right now. I have in here a mixture of honey and warm water. Pretty simple. I have in here a yeast slurry. And that's just yeast that's been dissolved in warm water, right, just to activate the yeast. And all I'm going to do is pour this yeast into this honey. And we're going to watch and see what happens. Yeast is a unicellular microorganism. It's basically a plant, right? It's the most common organism on the planet. We're all breathing yeast cells right now. They're all over the place. And yeast only does one thing, folks. Yeast consumes sugar, and it excretes alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's what yeast does. So if I have a solution with alcohol and carbon dioxide in it after the yeast has done its thing, what do we drink? every Friday afternoon at about 5 o'clock, that's basically water with alcohol and carbon dioxide. Beer. beer, exactly. So this is where we got beer from, right? So as we watch, we're going to see a nice cap of carbon dioxide form as this yeast starts to convert the sugar in the honey into ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. And that's fermentation in its most basic form. And that is where we get ethyl alcohol. Before we move on, I do want to talk to you quickly about the proof system in the US, because that's how we measure alcohol by volume, ABV, for spirits, spiritous liquors. So we all know that, as I mentioned, if we have 80 proof and we want to convert that to ABV, alcohol by volume, you cut it in half. And there's an interesting story behind that. Back in the day, we taxed spiritous liquors. We taxed things like Vodka, gin, rum, tequila. But we didn't know if the tax man came to your house and wanted to tax your moonshine, he couldn't necessarily prove that it was moonshine instead of water. You could sit there all day and argue that it was water, and he would say, no, it's moonshine. So what he would do is he would take some of the liquid in question, he would put it in a little spoon, and light it. Now, as it happens, a mixture of alcohol and water will burn as long as there is at least 50% alcohol in that mixture. So he would light it. If it lit, he would tax you because it was at least 50% alcohol. And the phrase became 50% alcohol, 100% proven that it was taxable. Okay, so that's where that comes from. And that way you'll always kind of remember the math. So cut the proof in half 
and you get the ABV. We're actually starting to measure spirits just by ABV now because those tax laws no longer apply and all we care about is how much alcohol is in the bottle. So pretty much all the spirits that you're going to see now have ABV on the bottle. So fermentation, sugar consumed by yeast converted into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Take a look over there and see how our fermentation is going. We seen a cap on that yet? This has only been in here for a couple of seconds, right? We're going to watch. This will probably overflow the cap. So Swathi, at some point, I may need you to run out and take care of this, but I'm going to try and keep it here. So we'll keep an eye on that. Whiskey, I mentioned, produced through the fermentation of barley, primarily. Barley. I used honey because honey has a nice sugar content. Barley, not so much. Not a lot of sugar in barley. So we'll talk about that in a minute. I want you to keep that in mind. Where is the sugar in barley? But that's later. So steps to making whiskey. First thing you need to do is take that barley and mash it up. You need to break the husks. You need to get to the middle of the barley where all the good stuff is. That's called mashing or washing. And that produces a liquid called wort. It's spelled wort, but it's actually pronounced wort. And that is a small mash tune. This is a large mash tune. This is the Glenfiddich Distillery in Scotland. I was just there a few weeks ago. These are enormous. You can see the scale. Once you have that, wa that wort, you then pitch the yeast, just like I did here, and you can see that yeast cap is growing, and it begins to ferment. It's usually done in an open container, just like that glass. This cap of CO2 essentially forms a cover on top of the wort, so nothing else can get in there. Once this fermentation starts, this is as good as sealed. So even though this is called open fermentation because it is an open vessel, it's actually a closed system. All right, this is a layer of CO2 that keeps anything else from getting in there. So open fermentation is still used today. This is actually the Maker's Mark distillery, I believe, is where I took that picture. So I mentioned now fermentation. And fermentation produces beer. Fermentation produces wine. Right? Fermentation produces cider, and fermentation produces mead. Those are our four basic fermented beverages. Beer is from barley. Cider is from what? Fruits. Good. Pomace fruits, usually apples, pears. Wine, we all know from grapes. Berries, actually, but mostly grapes. And mead. I mentioned mead. What is mead produced from? Honey. Honey. That's what I'm making right here. This is mead. We think mead is probably the oldest of all the fermented beverages. But the thing about fermented beverages, folks, is because alcohol is toxic, they stop at a certain ABV. The yeast goes dormant or dies. So you've never had wine at higher than about 18% alcohol, right? Beer in America, 5 or 6% alcohol. If you want to go higher than that, if you want to get to that 40% alcohol, or even higher, you have to physically pull the alcohol out. You have to separate the alcohol from the rest of the liquid. And you do that through a process called distillation. And that's really the core of the spirits industry. Distillation separates liquids based on a difference in boiling points. So we know water, for example, boils at about 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Turns out that ethyl alcohol boils at 173. So if I heat a mixture, of ethyl alcohol and water, if I heat this mixture to about 175, the ethyl alcohol will turn into a gas. It will boil. The water will remain liquid. If I then capture that gas, that ethyl alcohol gas, in something like this, and then cool it back down below 173, I've now separated the ethyl alcohol out and I left back in the pot just the water. Okay, and that is distillation. So I'm actually running here a distillation demonstration. In this pot, I have beer, plain old beer. 
It's exactly what this will be in about two days. Okay, so I'm doing the entire process in front of you. I now heat this up. This is going to heat to about 180. The ethyl alcohol will turn into a gas. Captured down here, this is ice. That will cool it back down. And dripping out of here in just a few minutes will be pure ethyl alcohol. And I'm going to prove that it's pure ethyl alcohol to you. How do you think I'm going to do that? Same way the tax collectors did. Exactly right. So somebody keep an eye on that. Can you see that from where you are? You let me know if that starts dripping. OK, great. So that is distillation. So these so far are all the basic steps to making whiskey. I have cereal grains. I mash them, mix them up with water, and break them down. I ferment them, and then I distill them. Unfortunately, all I have at that point is moonshine. I have just a clear distillate that's very harsh and very difficult to drink. In order to turn it into whiskey, I need to age it in wood, and that's where the magic happens. This is basically a diagram of a laboratory version of what I have going on right there. This is my favorite still in the whole world because I'm a huge MASH fan. And it shows you how simple this technology is, folks. This is actually based on a true story. MASH was actually based on true stories. And this was actually in a war zone in a tent, right? And they were actually making distillations in a war zone in a tent. This is the Glenfiddich Distillery in Speyside, Scotland. These pot stills are exactly the same as those, except they're giant. <coughs> Second type of distillation I'm going to mention very, very briefly is column distillation. This is called a pot still, a pot still. It's also called a batch still. And that's because you do it in batches. You put some beer in here, you distill it, you empty this out, and then you do it again. Really, really great, but it doesn't work so well for industrial settings because you have to keep starting it and stopping it. We're doing pretty good on this, yeah? Happens pretty quickly. You have to keep starting it and stopping it. They came up with another way to distill beverages based on heat exchange that allows you to consistently pump the beer in and pull the alcohol out because they have steam coming in from the top, distill it coming in from the bottom, and you can just keep the whole process going. This is called a column or continuous still. We use this for grain whiskeys, generally. So for those of you who are really, really into scotches, you know we have malt scotches and we have grain scotches. Malt scotches are generally made from barley. Grain scotches are generally made from wheat. They're lighter and they're a little cleaner. If you're going for a lighter, cleaner style of spirit, you're going to use a column still. If you're going for a more character-based style of spirit, you're going to use a pot still or a batch still. So I just mentioned that so that you guys can be familiar with what the two types of distillation are. This is what one actually looks like in the field. And now we have our distillate that actually comes out as what we call new whiskey or green whiskey. This then gets put in a barrel. Barrels were generally used for wine, right? Barrels were used to age wine. I want you to remember that wine was only reserved for the rich. In general, rich people drank wine. Wine's very expensive to make. Grapes are very temperamental, and it's a very labor-intensive process to make wine. So the rich people drank wine. Spirits, up until very recently, were generally consumed by the poor, by the lower classes, by the working classes, because all they wanted was that alcohol kick. So what they would do is take whatever the byproducts that happened to be in the area, they would ferment and distill, and then they would age them, and they would end up with spirits that were very unique to whatever regions you happen to be in. So for example, in Italy, you make a ton of wine in Italy, the peasants would take all the byproducts of making that wine. They would take the seeds, they would take the stems, they would take the leaves, they would take everything that wasn't actually used in making wine. They would take that home, they would press all that stuff again. And believe it or not, there's enough residual sugar left in those wine byproducts that they could ferment that liquid and then they would distill it and they would end up with their peasant spirit which is grappa. You heard of grappa? Grappa is made from the byproducts of winemaking. We've all had rum, yes? Rum is a byproduct of sugar making. 
They would make sugar. They would refine sugar. When you refine sugar, you end up with a ton of molasses and a ton of sugar cane syrup, which the rich people would just dump behind the plantations in giant lagoons. And it would rain and yeast would fall in them and it would ferment. And the peasants would take that liquid home and they would distill it and they would end up with rum. All right, so this is the story behind most spirits. And the reason I mention this to you is because I want to go to Scotland now, particularly the UK, where their spirit is based on barley. And they end up with a barley distillate. And they now have to store this. And what are they going to store it in? Well, they're going to store it in whatever the rich people are done using, which is wine barrels. And in Scotland in particular, it was sherry barrels because all of the nobles were drinking sherry. So they would take their raw distillate and put it in sherry barrels, take it out two or three or four years later, and lo and behold, it turned into an amazing, amazing elixir that they called Scotch whiskey. Or in that corner, they were just calling it whiskey. There was no other whiskey. It was just whiskey. And to this day, if you go to Scotland and you order whiskey, you don't order Scotch, you order whiskey, right? So barrels were traditionally used for wines. Once you put the alcohol in the barrel, that ethanol starts to dissolve really, really great stuff that's in the wood. Starts to dissolve some of the sugars in the wood, starts to dissolve some of the chemicals in the wood, things like lignans, which taste like vanilla. Starts to dissolve some of the caramels in the wood. And all of those things marry with the spirit over the course, this is, ah, thank you for keeping an eye on that. All of those things marry with the spirit over the course of many, many years and end up mellowing that alcohol and turning it into this whiskey that we love so much. So here's a cooperage. People who make barrels are called coopers. This was taken just a month or so ago. And this is all in Scotland. So you can age whiskey now in any number of different types of casks. And I want you to start using the word cask also. Barrel is not the right word. Cask is the word that we use. A barrel is actually a specific size of cask. It's the most common size, but cask is actually the correct technical term. French oak is mostly used in Europe. Oak is all we use, by the way. Oak is the only thing that you can age spirits in. We've tried every other type of wood. Nothing works like oak. French oak is mostly used in Europe and imparts a distinctive vanilla character to the spirit. American oak imparts more of a caramel character to the spirit. In addition to that, now I mentioned that this, these whiskeys were aged in casks that were used for other things by the wealthy people. And in Scotland, usually sherry. They didn't have the luxury of buying brand new casks. These were peasants. You used whatever happened to be around. So in Scotland, they were using sherry casks. That imparts a spicy character to the whiskey. We now don't use sherry casks. Most scotch is actually aged in bourbon casks because that's what we have the most of. So the vast majority of scotch in the world is aged in Jim Beam and Jack Daniels casks because that's, again, what we have. That imparts more of a sweet character to the whiskey. So if you taste scotch today aged in bourbon casks, it's significantly different from scotch produced about 50 years ago that's aged in sherry casks. And if you want to taste the difference, taste pretty much any scotch that you buy is going to be bourbon, but then buy Macallan. Macallan to this day is still aged in 100% sherry casks. So Macallan will give you a really good idea of what traditional sherry-aged scotch will taste like. And it is noticeably darker and noticeably more spicy. A couple of examples of cask sizes. I mentioned that just really briefly I want to touch on what this means. I want you to think now in terms of surface area. If I have a very, very large cask, I'm going to have much less reaction with the wood for a given amount of time. So as I am creating whiskeys now, I can actually determine how much effect the wood is going to have on the whiskey by the size of the cask that I use. 
So if I age my whiskey in a very small cask, I'm going to have much more interaction with the wood. If I age my whiskey in a large cask, I'm going to have much less interaction with the wood. I can age some whiskey in large, some whiskey in small, and blend them. I can age whiskey in a small cask for a short period of time. I can age whiskey in a large cask for a long period of time. I can control a whole bunch of different variables just based on the size of the cask. I also will char the inside of the cask. And that does two things. One, it removes some of the character from the previous fill. Whatever was in the cask, some of that will be removed by charring. The other thing it does is it caramelizes the sugars in the wood. Okay, so any of you guys cook? Who are my cooks here in the room? Yeah, you brown onions, right? We've all, we've all caramelized onions. They actually turn brown. Right? We've made caramel. You take white sugar, you heat it up, and it turns brown. That's called the Maillard reaction. That actually breaks complex sugars down into simple sugars. Easier to digest, so they taste sweeter to us. And that's what we're doing with this cast, the exact same thing. So when I add something like alcohol to the cask, it's now going to dissolve those sugars and incorporate those sugars into the spirit. What? Thank you. You guys are good. And I'm going to keep track of this. So are we impressed with fermentation, guys? I mean, how's that for like, what, 15, 20 minutes? It's as simple as that. And believe it or not, there are college kids all over the country that are doing this right now in their fridge. You can literally take cider, and you can put yeast in the cider, and they put a balloon on top just to make an airlock. They don't need to, but they do. And you will end up with drinkable dry cider after about three days. And remember, the beautiful thing about fermentation and alcoholic beverages in general, they're difficult to make taste well. It's difficult to make beer taste good. It's impossible to make a fermented beverage that will harm you unless you drink too much of it. But other than that, <laughs> it will be safe to drink. And believe it or not, it will be safer to drink than the local water supply if we're anywhere outside of a few hundred years from today, right? You're safer drinking a fermented beverage than you would be drinking from the river, stream, or well. All right? Really, really simple stuff. So let's see what we have going on right here. My handy dandy torch. Good? Can we see this? Yes? Okay. And that, folks, is as difficult as distillation gets. So what I've done right in front of you within the space of about, what, 30 minutes, is we've gone from honey and yeast. The only thing I skipped is I took this and put it in a can. But other than that, it was the exact same thing. Honey and yeast right down to moonshine. If I then put this in wood, I end up with whiskey. So you've seen the whole process. Very, very low tech, stuff that's been going on for centuries. Okay, we can have different levels, getting back to the cask, different levels of cask char. The longer you char the cask, the darker the roast, and it's the same like coffee. You end up with more caramel, more sugars. Darker char gives you a darker, con a darker character to the whiskey. This is a, what we do with the cask after. We just put them in warehouses. But now we come back to the big question. And this is really what makes scotch so interesting to me. Where is the sugar in barley, folks? We've all had, many of us probably have not had barley, but we've all had things that are similar to barley. We've had granola, we've had cereal, right? We don't generally think of grains as being particularly sweet. And we know that in order for fermentation to happen, we have to have sugar. That's what yeast consumes. And it has to be in solution. We can't just have a pile of sugar. It's got to be in water, right? Which is why I did this. So where is the sugar in barley? There isn't much. Barley is a seed. Barley's a all I think seeds in general are amazing. Seeds are basically little lifeboats for baby plants. Right? That's what they are. They're lifeboats for baby plants. And we have found seeds in Egyptian tombs, believe it or not, that we can then plant and get to germinate. That's how good seeds are at preserving the baby plant inside. 
But there's a trick that they have to use in order to be so good at this. We consume sugar. Life consumes sugar, including plants. That plant needs sugar to grow. But if the, if the mother plant were to just surround the baby plant with sugar, guess what would happen? Yeast would eat it. Everything would eat it. It would never end up being in a tomb for 2,000 years and then be able to germinate. So plants came up with a cool trick. They took the sugar and they said, we're going to change the form of the sugar just a little bit and we're going to turn it into something called starch, which is a carbohydrate. We're going to turn it into starch. Starch now actually is something that you can't act, if you're yeast, you can't act on. So starch is something that you can surround the plant with and nothing else will be able to eat that starch. Unfortunately, the plant can't eat it either. Before the plant can use it, it has to be converted back to sugar. So the mother plant does two things. One, it surrounds the baby plant with starch, and two, it puts a little enzyme packet in the seed. And that enzyme packet is activated when the seed is planted. When you plant the seed, the enzyme packet breaks open, converts the starch into sugar, and the plant can now use it in order to grow until it breaks the ground and can start photosynthesis. But how does the seed know when it's been planted? When it gets wet. That's the signal, when it gets wet. So if I have barley, which is essentially starch, but I want to convert that starch into sugar so that I can ferment it, what I have to do is trick that barley into thinking it's been planted. So what we do is we lay it out on a floor and we wet it down. When we wet it down, that enzyme starts to react with the starch, converts the starch into sugar, and the baby plant begins to grow. This is called malting. And if you've heard the term malted barley or malt, that's what they're talking about. Once that baby plant starts to grow, we know the starch has been converted into sugar, and we need to then stop that conversion. We do that by reversing the process that started it. We dry the barley out. Right? And we do that by generally lighting low fires under the barley. It will dry the barley out. It will stop that process. And now we can take that barley. We can mash it. As I showed you, we can ferment it, and we can distill it. So that whole process is called malting, and that is what ends up giving scotch its really, really distinctive character. Because in order to dry the barley, we have to, as I mentioned, light fires under it. And in Scotland, they don't have a lot of wood. What they do have is peat moss. And peat moss has a very distinctive aroma. I'm going to pass it out for you. Go ahead and pass that around the room and just nose that. And that is the aroma of peat moss. That aroma from drying the barley, that smoke character, ends up staying with the whiskey through the grinding process, through the washing process, through the fermentation, through the distillation, through the aging in wood for up to 25, 30 years, and into the bottle. And we still don't understand how that smoke character ends up lasting through that whole process, but it does. And it's really, really amazing to me. And it's one of the things, as I said, that makes scotch so interesting. And it's really important that we understand why this malting process is necessary. All right? And it's all about making that sugar accessible to the distiller before it was accessible to anything else. Because if that plant was surrounded by sugar, it would never be able to survive as a seed. Make sense? Okay. So here we have what I call the magic of malting. So to produce ethanol from grains, you have to convert the starch back to fermentable sugars through the process called malting. This is starch and water yields maltose, which is a form of sugar that we use to ferment, and oxygen. That's the malting equation. 
Grains are made to germinate by soaking in water, which develops the enzymes. This is called modifying the starch back into sugars. And this is the process that allows us, essentially, to form the spirit industry. The maltose that we produce is then broken down into fructose and glucose. Yeast can then convert those fructose and glucose molecules into ethanol and carbon dioxide through fermentation. Here's your equation. Glucose yields ethanol and carbon dioxide. So that is essentially the chemistry behind the spirits industry. And I say that every drop of alcohol is essentially a ray of starshine because that's really where this all comes from. Our bodies retrieve the energy stored in the chemical bonds of ethanol through the oxidation to acetaldehyde and finally acetyl. And basically, I like to say that's why I hate the matrix. Because if you remember, in the matrix, they never counted for the fact that energy was being put into the system. They were just constantly harvesting people, right? You have to have energy put into the system at some point. And it always has to start with sunshine. So this is what floor malting looks like. Just a bunch of barley laid out over the floor. This is what a peat bog looks like. This is where we actually harvest the peat that we'll then use to dry the malt. And this is what the malted barley looks like. They'll actually, they can tell when to stop the malting process by the length of those rootlets. And the master malter will actually go through and pick up a handful of malted barley and measure the length of the rootlets. And by the length of the rootlets, he can tell whether or not the sugar has been completely modified. So let's look at a summary now of making whiskey. First, we have to harvest the grain. Then we have to mill the grain. We have to crack the shell of the grain to get to the inside. We wash it into wort. We then ferment, ferment the wort into beer, distill the beer into new whiskey. We age it into casks. At that point, we can now blend the whiskey. Very, very common in the industry. We've all had Johnny Walker, yes? We've all had Dewar's. These are all blended whiskeys. What a blended whiskey is, is you'll take whiskey from a number of different distillers, a number of different ages, and you'll blend them all together. And the idea is to produce a consistent whiskey over time. So if whiskey A comes in a little sweeter than usual, you'll maybe use a little less of it in the blend in order to maintain a consistent profile. Next time it comes in a little less sweet, you'll use a little more of it. But your whiskey blend the profile will be consistent over time. All right, those are called blended whiskeys. The alternative to a blended whiskey is what's called a single malt whiskey. And we've all had single malt scotches. And a single malt whiskey is a single distillery and generally a single harvest of malt. So it's much more difficult to maintain consistency over time. Any variation in that malted whiskey is going to show up in the end product. Whatever comes off the still, whatever comes out of that barrel, that's what's gonna end up in the bottle. So if you're trying to make Macallan, and you end up with a batch that doesn't quite taste like the way Macallan used to taste, you have to sell that batch to a blender. You can't bottle it as Macallan because your customers are not gonna want it. They're not gonna be used to that. Right? So single malt is a little bit riskier to make. We do, that peat, the, the peat's making its round, the smoke, right? Pretty intense, yes? So, some of the flavors that we're looking for in whiskeys in general, obviously grain is gonna be the primary flavor in all whiskeys. Cereal, sometimes described as bran, biscuity, malty, mashy. Wood is, is the next most prominent flavor, and there are some distillers that actually say wood is the most prominent flavor. A lot of the folks that I work with today are saying that 60% of the flavor of any whiskey comes from the wood. And they're actually investing a lot of money in what they call wood technology. We have, has anyone ever tried Maker's 46? No? Okay, so we all know Maker's Mark, yes? Maker's Mark came out with a new, a new bourbon. Now, Maker's Mark is a bourbon. They came up with a new bourbon called Maker's 46. It was the first new product that they'd introduced in about 55 years. 
Makers 46 is what they called it. And people can't figure out why they called it Makers 46. People think that it's 46 years old. People think that it's 46 proof. 46 is actually the number of what they call the wood profile out of 100 different types of wood that they tested, they ended up using the 46th. So they called Makers 46, Makers 46, based on the wood profile. And my point here is that they tried 40, uh, 100 different types of wood, charred 100 different ways, before they came up with one that they felt worked. And that's the, the level of investment and time that people are putting into wood technology today because wood has so much influence on the final character of the whiskey. All right, so oak, cedar, um, nut, marzipan, walnut, all these things can come from wood. In addition to that, we have what we call sweet aromatics, and that's things like vanillas, caramels, maple syrup. Believe it or not, those also come from the wood. And that's from the caramelization of sugar. And then we have the spice component. And the spice component also comes generally from the wood. There's a little bit added by the cereal, but most of it is from the wood. Fruit and floral. We can get everything from cherries, oranges, blackberries, peaches, to things like rose and lavender. For scotch and Irish whiskeys, we have peat, which you guys have all just smelled and tasted, and then the astringent notes that come from the alcohol itself. So let's talk now a little bit about Scotch whiskey in particular, so you have an idea of what the Scotch whiskey regulations are. One, in order to be called Scotch, it has to be made in Scotland. And believe it or not, that's a revelation to some folks, right? You can't call it Scotch if it's not made in Scotland. It has to be made from malted barley, and it has to be distilled to less than 95%. So now that you guys know a lot about fermentation and distillation, I want you to start thinking about, when I say things like it has to be distilled to less than 95% alcohol, let's talk about what that means. Why would they restrict the percentage that I can distill whiskey to? Why would they say I can't distill it above a certain percent. Any thoughts on that? You bet. Yep, you get a change in the flavor profile. The, the more pure the alcohol coming off the still, the less character of the base grain that comes with it. All right, so think about that for a second. If coming out of this still is 99% ethyl alcohol, there's almost nothing left of the original base grain in that 99%. If I reduce that to 80%, let's say, 20% is water that comes from the base grain. And with that water is going to be essential oils, esters, aromatics. So the lower the percent you distill to, the more original character of the base grain you preserve. So for a spirit like whiskey, where we want that base character, we want that grain character, you want to restrict the distillation ABV. Can you think of a spirit where they would want to distill to a very high percent, where they want very little of the base character? Vodka. You got it. Who said vodka? Yes, vodka. Vodka wants to be odorless, colorless, tasteless. That's what it wants. So vodka has to be distilled to a very, very high percent. Whiskey says, no, you can't distill above a certain percent. We want that base character, okay? I mentioned pot distillation and column distillation early on. Again, now you know enough about distillation, I can talk about that a little bit. With a column distillation or a continuous distillation process, I want to take a look at what we have going on right here. With a still, if I'm doing a batch distillation, I have water and alcohol, and it starts to heat up. Before it gets to about 175, there are other things in here besides water and alcohol. There are things that come from the grain that are in there. There are oils, there are esters, there are all kinds of other things in there. Some things good, some things not so good, all based from the plant. Before that alcohol starts to turn into a gas, other things start to evaporate first. 
things with a lower boiling point than alcohol. We call those the heads. All right, they have certain flavors. Then the alcohol starts to turn into a gas and, and, and evaporate. We call that the heart. That's pure ethanol. Once the alcohol is done, other things with a higher boiling point than the alcohol start to evaporate. We call those the tails. And those also have flavors and, and odors associated with them. What we really want is that heart cut. We want the ethanol. But in a pot or batch distillation, we get the heads first, then we get the heart, and then we get the tails. The distiller can decide what cut he's going to take. So I want you to think about a couple things now. One from an economic standpoint. You want to take the largest cut possible because everything that you're not putting in the bottle you're throwing away and that's waste. So you want to take the largest cut possible. But the larger the cut you take, the more heads and tails end up in the bottle. And that oftentimes gives you odors and aromas that you may not want. During Prohibition, for example, we've all heard of bathtub gin, right? We know that pr during Prohibition, alcohol wasn't particularly high quality. Moonshine, to this day, has a reputation for making you go blind, right? Because moonshine, produced in the mountains of West Virginia by a guy who probably doesn't have a PhD in chemistry, he's just taking the whole thing and putting it in a bottle. He's maximizing his profits. Those heads and tails will make you sick. They will make you blind. They're toxic. Okay? They also do, however, contribute flavors and odors to the final product. So you take too much and you end up with off odors, off aromas, and some toxins. You take too little, however, and you're not making any money. So there's a happy medium in there that you have to decide on what you're going to take. That's pot distillation or batch distillation. Column distillation, because it's continuous, you don't have to worry about that. There's heads when you turn it on. And then it runs for weeks. Heart, 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 heart. And then tails when you turn it off. So a column or continuous still is a much cleaner, purer method of distilling alcohol. And believe it or not, with whiskey, and scotch whiskey in particular, you're not allowed to use column distillation for single malts because they don't want it to be that clean. They want the character that's imparted by some heads and some tails. They don't just want pure ethyl alcohol. So, a couple of interesting things on this slide. One, we're limiting the percent ABV for distillation in an attempt to preserve character of those base grains. We're also saying pot stills, baby, in an attempt to preserve the character of those base grains. So do you see how whiskey, and scotch whiskey in particular, it's very, very important that they preserve that malted barley character in the bottle, as opposed to, again, some spirits that we can talk about, like vodka, where that's not important. And this is one of, to me, one of the really, really interesting things about whiskey, is it's all about preserving that grain experience. Real quick, and then I'm going to wrap up so that we can go drink. But again, I just want you to know a little bit about some of these things in Scotland. Um, there are four basic regions that produce uh, Scotland, and then one that doesn't really do a whole lot. We have the Lowlands, the Highlands, Isle of Scotches, and Speyside. Campbelltown doesn't produce a whole lot anymore. The one that I want to point out for the average person, or the two actually, Isla and Speyside. So Isla Scotch, if you like that peat aroma, if you like that smoke that I passed out, you want to drink Isla Scotches. All right, you may want to write that down. It is pronounced Isla. And Isla Scotches are known for producing very peaty, very smoky Scotches. Speyside is the largest region, so they, not the largest geographic region, they produce the most Scotches, and they produce generally what's considered to be the classic Scotch whiskey. So if you want to get started on very classic malt scotches, look for Speyside scotches. And we're actually going to taste you, uh, when we go upstairs, we're going to taste you on Drambuie 15, which is a Speyside malt. Okay? Any questions? No? Yes? Why is it always the same years, like 12, 15? Great question. So 
the, the question was, why do you always see the same years on the bottle? One thing about years, know that the year is the youngest scotch in the bottle by law. So if, there's, if the bottle says 12, there may be older scotches in that bottle, but there can't be anything younger than 12 in the bottle. Convention has said that we're going to bottle scotch at 6 years, 8 years, 12 years, and 15 years. Just convention. You'll see scotch is bottled at 17. You'll see scotch is bottled at 25. It's just a convention that the industry has sort of adopted over time. Anything else? Yes? How does sour mash work? Sour mash is an American uh, tradition. And sour mash is what they use for bourbons and Tennessee whiskey. And all sour mash means is that they use a starter. Anyone bake bread here? Do I have any bed breaker, bread bakers? You know, sourdough bread? Sourdough bread is always started by um, the same yeast strain. They'll actually preserve the yeast from batch to batch, right? And they will seed the next batch with the yeast from that because yeast is really what contributes most of the flavor to these things. And sour mash just means that they will seed it with uh, a, a batch from the previous distillation or fermentation, rather. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so bourbon whiskey now, in order to be called bourbon, you have to be made in the United States, not, as opposed to Scotland. Not bourbon county, folks. It just is the United States. And the base grain in bourbon is corn, because that's our base grain. That's what we have here in this country. So bourbon is a whiskey. Bourbon has to be made in new casks by law. You don't, put, you don't make bourbon in, in a cask that was used for something else. Brand new American oak casks. So when you're done making the bourbon, you only have two things you can do with that cask. You can throw it out, or you can sell it to a scotch whiskey manufacturer. Okay, because bourbon can only use new casks. You, don't, you need to have, in or, if it's bigger than one gallon, which this is not, or if it's not being used in a laboratory or educational setting, then you need to have a distilling license to operate it. So it's a good question. You probably don't have one. <laughs> you probably don't have this this would be considered a laboratory educational setting. A school would be considered a laboratory educational setting. A laboratory would be considered a laboratory educational setting. <laughs> Filtration of? Yeah, so in other words, do they do it? How do they do it? I'm sorry? Yeah, so filtration, there's two theories of filtration. One is that it's totally fine and it's a good thing because it clarifies the liquid. And two is that it completely ruins the scotch and don't ever do it, right? So all we're trying to do with filtration is remove solid particulates from the scotch. And there are a bunch of different ways that they do it. They can add pectin, they can do chill filtration. Um, I personally think that it will remove a little bit of the character from the scotch. Um, but I've had tons and tons of filter scotches. Most of the scotches that we've all had in our lives have been filtered. They're delicious. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but the scotch purists will tell you that they're not fans of filtered scotch. Did you know, like, uh, what causing, uh, what, what causes the different flavors from different regions? Is the water or the barley or the mixture? I'm sorry? What causes the different flavors depending on where it is in Scotland? Yes, what causes the different flavors? Really, really good. So, Let's go to the map. So these, this is our Scotch region. This is the Highlands. This is Speyside. This is the Lowlands, Campbelltown, and Isla. So Isla, you can see, are all island regions. So the, the, what causes the flavor that's characteristic to the Isla Scotches is one, peat. There are no forests on the coast. There's only peat bogs. So when they do the malting process and they dry the barley, they're using peat to light those flames. That's number one. Number two, all of the air here is full of salt, right? Because you're on the coast. And that salt, that salted air will permeate the casks because wood is porous. 
and get into the, to the casks and impart a saltiness to the scotch. If you go into the highlands now, this is a much more forested, wooded area. The water is much cleaner and purer than you're going to get on the coast. You guys have all had water in Florida or Virginia Beach or the Hamptons. Totally different character from water that's from upstate New York. Exact same thing going on here. Also, the vegetation is very different in these regions. And you, you've heard the term terroir with wine. It has to do with, if, if you boil down to the science of what terroir is, it's the local chemicals. It's things in the plant, plant local plants, things in the local um, soil, uh, mineral formations, all those things that vary from region to region, whether it's clay soil, whether it's rocky soil, whether it's sandy soil. So all of these things are going to manifest themselves not only in the water, but in the actual grain and in, sometimes in the air and in the wood. So all of that will combine to change the character of the scotch. Uh, I think this is something about the distillation. So you said that the output there is almost 100% alcohol, right? Here, not quite, but <laughs> let's pretend. Okay, but then uh, how do you get to the 40%? Is it all the Good question. Or? Really good question. Okay. Great question. You, di you didn't miss it. I skipped it because we're trying to do this in a short amount of time. When you pull it out of the barrel, it will come out of the barrel at, uh, let's call it 115 to 120 proof, 60% alcohol, right? You then will take it and add water to that whiskey that you pulled out of the barrel before you put it in the bottle. You'll actually, what they call, reduce it by adding water. That water that you add will also affect the flavor. It used to be that you were making scotch up here, you would pull the scotch out of the barrel, you would add water from this region into the bottle, and then you would ship it. What they do now, unfortunately, is they take the scotch from here, they put it in a tanker truck, and then they ship it down to Glasgow. And then they take the scotch from here, they put it in a tanker truck, and they ship it down to Glasgow. Once it gets to Glasgow, they take Glaswegian water, fill up the bottles, and then ship it to the rest of the world, because it's a lot cheaper that way. Okay, but really, really good question. So we're always adding water before we put it back in the bottle. What regulation is there for that? There is no regulation for that. And I'm not supposed to tell you that, but I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. It's, it's one of the dirty secrets of scotch. How do you make sure there's no methanol in the Very, very good question. So the methanol is actually going to be in the heads and the tails. So the, the question is, how do you make sure there's no methanol, which is, which is wood alcohol, and there is. There, it'll be in the heads and the tails, so you have to be very careful what you cut. That's one of the things you have to make sure that you don't, you're not including methanol in your cut. So the producers have a test probably afterwards? Yeah, and they're, they're, they're actually ridiculous at it. These guys, they can tell by smell. If, these guys have been doing this for like 40, 50 years. They can, you, what they'll do is, at some point in the distillation process, there's an open, uh, an open container, and they'll actually dip and smell. You would think that they would be doing like a chemical test, or we, we, you know, I, I was hoping they were doing a chemical test, but they're not. They're actually, they, they can actually smell, and they'll know where in the cut they are just by smell. It's really, it's crazy. No, it's not, it's not. Methanol is going to be in the, I'm going to get this wrong. I think methanol is going to be in the tails. It's one or the other. I forget which one it is, though. Um, What's that? Yeah. Is what? Are there any brands that don't use the Glaswegian water so we can taste the difference? Edgerdower doesn't, and... Talis right, Talisker doesn't. There's a few brands that don't, but the majority of them do. Where are you getting the ABV? Are you using like a hydrometer, a refractor? Yes, they're using a hydrometer. So why do you just in the bottles? Does whiskey have that uh, ageability? So once the whiskey is put into the bottle, does it all the time uh, get a different character or not once it Once you put it in a bottle, it becomes completely non-reactive. Was that your question? Well, with wine, for example, you also put it in the bottle and it doesn't really react. But what happens is there's substance which breaks down, and that's how it ages. So it doesn't have any effect on that or on the No. Once you put whiskey in a bottle, everything stops. 
So whiskey can last, unlike wine, whiskey actually will last almost indefinitely if it's sealed properly in the bottle. It's completely non-reactive once it's in the bottle. It, it has to do with the fact that there's less solids in it and that there's much higher alcohol content. It's why, that if you're familiar with things like port and sherry, which are what we call fortified wines, where they actually add alcohol back to the wine, the reason they do that is so that when you put it in a bottle, it will last longer and then you can ship it. Port and Sherry was actually developed for shipping. Their design, their product, some of the first products that were specifically developed for export. And that's one of the reasons why. You increase the alcohol content, it lasts longer in the bottle. I see, um, you may have said this earlier, but I see Tranzui on the logo. So where did that come in? Great question. I probably should have talked about that more since that's my brand. <laughs> Um, so Drambuie, just so that you know, I am the national brand ambassador for Drambuie. Drambuie is a scotch liqueur, which means it's scotch that has sugar or some sweetener, in our case honey, and spices. So we have liquors or spirits, which is what we were talking about, whiskeys. So rum, vodka, gin, whiskey, um, all those things are spirit, liquors or spirits. Then we have liqueurs or cordials which are essentially spirits that have sweetener and flavors added to them. And those are things like Frangelico, Chambord, Cointreau, Grand Marnier, and Drambouille. So you have to have flavoring and sweetener in order to be called a liqueur or cordial, interchangeable. Drambouille happens to be a scotch-based liqueur. So it is a blended scotch, 80 proof, blended scotch, just like Dewar's. And we add heather honey and a proprietary blend of herbs and spices, and you will t taste that upstairs in, uh, we have, you can taste it straight, and we also have cocktails. And we also have a new product called Drambuie 15, which is a 15-year-old Speyside single malt. Not a blended scotch, it is actually a blend of single malts, and they're all 15 years old, and they're all from Speyside, and to that we then add our Drambuie elixir, which is the sweetener and the herbs. But it is a scotch, and that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of into this whole scotch thing. If I'm a home beer brewer, I can make a decent batch of beer in a week or two. Yep. If I'm a home distiller, am I waiting three years to make something that tastes drinkable? You're not allowed to be making whiskey at home. <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> number two, no. Um, you, can, you, can, uh, you can make your beer, you can distill it very quickly. If you want to age it in a cask, you're probably looking at about five years. I don't know, I've never tried it, I swear though. Yes, good. Guys, you got to do me a favor. If you really want to learn more about this than I can do in an hour, take my class at the Institute of Culinary Education. We do three hours of this. You taste 35 different whiskeys. It's really, really great. Um, and I will go, I will get even deeper into this. But one of the things that I will tell you, when you taste spirits, particularly whiskeys, please open them up. So that means add water to them. So if you, if you ever have, if any of you guys have a friend where you go out and you order whiskey and then you, you look at them and, and you want ice but you won't because you're with them and you know they're gonna laugh, don't hang out with that person anymore because <laughs> they don't have your best interest at heart. I want you to add water when you do tastings with distillers, with the guys who make this stuff. If you sit down at a distillery with the master distiller, he's gonna give you a glass of whiskey, a glass of water, and a medicine dropper, and he wants you to add water to the whiskey. All right, 80 proof is a number that we came up with for shipping, not for drinking, okay? It's for shipping. We want you to open it up, so add water, add ice. I tell people up to equal parts water is fine. You, if you drink 80 proof whiskey, your mouth, it burns. It does, and it's supposed to, because it's toxic. Remember I put that up early on? It's toxic. So. At a certain, what you'll see is if you, if you do this with a master distiller, you put a drop of water and then you taste it. Then you put another drop of water and you taste it and you keep doing that. One drop along the line, all of a sudden the burn's going to go away. It's just going to shut off. It may be 12 drops for you. It may be 20 drops for you. But it's going to be the same every time for each person. And that's called your alcohol threshold. So what they ask you to do is write that number down and then the next time they give you a sample, put those number of drops in and then taste it. Okay, because if you don't do that, you're not tasting anything. All your tongue is telling you is, this is poison, spit it out, please. <laughs> we don't want that. So, add water, I add ice. I only drink whiskey with full rocks. That's how I like it, all right? And I, believe me, I know what I'm doing. So, 
please, water and ice to taste. There's nothing wrong with drinking it neat, what we call neat, which is right from the bottle into the glass, that's fine. But if you don't enjoy that, and most people don't, please, 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 add water, add ice until you enjoy it. That's what we want you to do. Thanks for asking that. Anything else? You guys thirsty? Let's go.